Well, hey, how is everyone doing this morning? It's good to see all of you. If we haven't met before, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here at King's Church, and I get the honor of continuing our sermon series today, Does God Want Me to Be Happy? And it's a special Sunday, uh, and first of all, there's lots of ways to get involved. Can we just give it up for Casey? She's so amazing, doing all the announcements, like a champion. We got a lot going on right now. So many great ways to get connected that you heard about. So we just encourage you, hey, just pick one way to take your next step to get involved here at King's Church, especially as we come into the new year. One of the most powerful things that you can do in your life is get plugged into a community. And we have something actually special coming up next Sunday called Welcome to Church. It'll happen here at our church right after each of our worship experiences. And it's a brief gathering, about 20 minutes, where you can meet the staff. You can hear the vision and mission of our church, and you can kind of take your next steps towards making King's Church your home. This is kind of an opportunity for you to hear more about us, for us to get to know you and you to kind of get the information you need to see if this is the place you want to make your home. So if you haven't signed up for that, if you're interested in that, head to kings.news and sign up for that. It's also a special Sunday because over the next few weeks, we're going to be celebrating the season of Advent. And I don't know about you, but growing up personally, uh, I grew up in a Pentecostal charismatic tradition where we didn't do some of the more liturgical things. And so in my adult life, I started to celebrate Advent and it's got such a powerful meaning to it. And so it's the four weeks leading up to Christmas where we celebrate the beautiful realities that come along with this season, which is hope, love, joy, and peace. And each week, we'll have these candles that are here, and we'll light one of those candles to represent one of those pillars of the season of Advent. And each week, we'll have a reading where we talk about what Advent means through one of those perspectives. And so Advent is derived from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. And so it's a time in church history where we celebrate the reality that Jesus stepped or that God stepped into human history through the person of Jesus and into the manger. And so during this holiday season, we look back and we celebrate that the Messiah has come. And we also look forward in the same way that the people in the Old Testament looked forward to Jesus's arrival. We as the church look forward and long for Jesus to return a second time where he'll ultimately bring the consummation of his kingdom and the end of every evil power and he'll wipe away every tear and he'll once and for all set up his kingdom and allow us to be in perfect relationship with him and God the Father. And so we, in light of this, we look at the Advent hymn. We'll do a brief reading from this hymn. Oh, Come, O come, Emmanuel, which perfectly represents the church's cry during the Advent season. And this is what the hymn says. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. And so while Israel would have sung this song in expectation for Christ's first coming, the church now sings it in commemoration of his first coming and expectation of his second coming in the future. And so today we're going to light the candle of hope. We're going to light the candle of hope knowing that our hope is ultimately in the work that God is doing now to establish his kingdom through the church and ultimately Jesus' second coming to bring about the power of his kingdom here on earth and to once and all bring heaven and earth together. And so I just want to take a brief moment and pray from the perspective of hope. Pray for you as a church. Pray for you if you're watching online. Pray for anyone who can hear my voice and for our city that we would experience deeply the hope that comes in this season and in the reality of Jesus's coming. So let's pray before we jump into our sermon today. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful for your love and your goodness that Jesus, you stepped into human history to be with us and that as we look forward to Christmas, that we're not just celebrating a fun tradition in the history of America, but rather we are celebrating the eternal reality that God came to be with us, to set us free from the power of sin and death, to save us from the power of evil inside of our souls, Lord. And so we celebrate that and we look with hope towards the future for the second coming of your son, Jesus, Lord as he will come and set everything right once and for all. And so we pray for the people in our church that they would experience hope in the midst of this season. That over the next few weeks, that as we approach the Christmas morning, Lord, where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that we would be able to grab onto the hope that comes in the message of Jesus. And that the people in our city who maybe are experiencing hopelessness or loneliness now, that they would be able to be drawn towards your love 
and your goodness. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen. Amen. Well, Sanjay is going to come and join us. We're going to jump in, as I said, to the series that we're in right now, which is titled, Does God Want Me to Be Happy? And he's going to read from Philippians. If you'd like to open up to that, you can also go ahead and stand as we read God's word, which is the custom in our house to stand in honor of God's word. We're going to open up to Philippians chapter 4, and he's going to read verses 8 through 13. It'll also be up on the screen for you to follow along. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who strengthens me. And now in Urdu, e bhaiyo aur behno, jitni baate sach hai, layak hai, munasif hai, pat hai, दिलकश है और पसंदीदा है यानी जो अच्छी और काबिल तारीफ है उन्हीं बातों पर गौर किया करो आ, मैं पस्त होने भी जानता हूं और भूख होने भी जानता हूं और हर एक बात और सब हालतों में सिर होना सीखा है जो मुझे ताकत बख्शता है उसकी मदद से this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as I said, we're in the middle of a series called Does God Want Me to Be Happy? And the underlying theme of this series is this question. How do I experience the joy that my soul is searching for? How do I experience the joy that God has for me? How do I grab a hold of the joy that comes from God? And we've been unpacking that in different ways throughout the last few weeks. And today I want to invite you into a conversation that Paul is having here at the end of the book of Philippians, where he's going to talk to us about joy in our thinking. Joy in our thinking. And Paul is taking a moment at the end of chapter 4 of Philippians, and he's talking to us about what it is that dominates our thought life. What is it that we're thinking about and dwelling upon in our lives? And Paul knows this deep reality that's true that has actually also been bared out through science as we've gone throughout time, which is this, that whatever it is that dominates your thoughts, whatever it is that you think about the most is the thing that will most influence and impact who you are and who you become. And so what's interesting is that Paul is writing from a jail cell and he's writing to the church that he helped to start And he's encouraging them in the midst of intense pressure and persecution from the Roman Empire to abandon the way of Jesus. He's encouraging them on how they can continue to live this life that God has called them to in the midst of all the struggles and difficulties that they're experiencing. And so one of the underlying themes of the book of Philippians or the letter of Philippians that Paul writes is this idea of joy, specifically joy in suffering and difficulty. And one of the things that Paul uses to close out his letter is this idea of what it is that dominates our thoughts and our minds. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the scriptures say this deep truth that whatever it is that we think about the most is the thing that we will become. And so as we begin our conversation today, I just want you to to think about this question as we go through these verses together, and it's this. What is it that dominates your thoughts and your mind the most? 
that thing, whatever it is, will be the thing that ends up working its way out into your actual, real, everyday life. I love the way that Dallas Willard, the theologian, puts it. He says this, The ultimate freedom we have as individuals is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon and think about. By think, we mean all the ways in which we are aware of things, including our memories, perceptions, and beliefs. The focus of our thoughts significantly affects everything else that happens in your life and evokes the feelings that frame your world and motivates your actions. Whatever it is that dominates your thoughts will work its way into your heart and it'll shape who you are and you'll end up seeing it work its way out into your everyday life. So as we begin, ask yourself this question, what is it that most dominates my thoughts? As I was reflecting on this sermon and praying through it and studying, I realized that this actually happened to me in my life personally. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided that I wanted to change up my fitness routine. And I, I kind of would work out for maybe 30 or 45 minutes. And if I did cardio, it was max like 45 minutes. And I wanted to try and maybe elongate that time period. Can I create endurance in my body to run for hours at a time? And for some of you, that might sound terrible. And for me, it sounded terrible. I didn't like running. And then one day I saw this video on Instagram that got pushed to me and it was just a guy. He was all alone. He was on this beautiful trail and there was this emotional music behind him and he was just running. And I thought, I gotta run. I gotta start running. And I'm like, I want it. I'm thinking about it. Now it's, it's in my mind. It's like this worm that entered into my brain. So I'm like, I gotta follow this guy. I love it. What a beautiful video. There's a guy running on a trail. This is great. So I follow this guy. He's a fitness influencer, gives all these tips on how to run. And then Instagram is like, okay, this is how the algorithm works, baby. He, they just start pushing me video after video of all these different guys. And they're all running on trails all alone with this beautiful music in the background. I'm like, is there like a group chat I'm not aware of? Like, they're all just these fitness influencers. Like, hey guys, this month, just all videos of you alone on a trail. Emotional music, even better. If you're shirtless, that's the biggest win. And it worked. All I could think about was running. That's all, that's all that dominated my mind. And then I found myself researching it, researching how do I get better at running, studying it. Then I started actually running. And I started running more and more. And eventually I ran a marathon. And that, those thoughts about running, uh, yes, yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> I didn't say that to be like, look at me. A lot of people, the amount of old people that pass me, you're like, it's not the greatest achievement. Anyways, so I started running more and more. I started thinking about it. And I started buying gear. I got this watch. This is my running watch. It tracks me with GPS, which is amazing. I bought these gloves. Got these bad boys. Got them on a Cyber Monday deal just this past week. It wasn't a Cyber Monday deal. They were like, the algorithm was like, you don't need to give him a deal. He's going to buy them anyways. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. And I got all this gear to start. And my shorts, they just kept getting shorter and shorter. And I'm like, what is happening? I don't understand. I have no power to control this. And then I'm like, I'm really going to up my game. And I bought these glasses. Don't make fun of me. Boom. Got these bad boys. Bought these like nine months ago. I think I wore them two times. But I felt so good. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror with all this gear on. I'm walking around my house without my shirt on. And my family's like, dude, where'd your shirts go? I'm like, don't worry about it. Just give me a trail and some emotional music. I'll be fine. And I looked at myself and I thought, what have I become? Look at me. And I realized, oh, I became the thing that I thought about the most. And it's true in your life. Whatever it is that dominates your thoughts and your thinking will be the thing that you actually become. And sometimes it's benign, you know, it's like a thing like running. And sometimes it can be something that is beautiful, that brings something beautiful into the world. And sometimes it can bring things that are terrible into the world. Some of you, your thinking is dominated by your past and you can't see your future. Some of you, your thinking is dominated by thoughts that the enemy is trying to put into your mind to destroy you from what God has for you in the future. Some of you, your thinking has been muddled by the people in your life that told you you'll never be able to achieve that thing. And see, what Paul is saying at the end of Philippians is that he wants to help you learn how to elevate your mind so that you can see the way that God sees, so that you can think the way that God thinks so that you can see the future that God has for you. Because there's this unique feature in the human existence that no other creature alive has, and it's, that it's this reality of your imagination. 
that human beings have the unique ability to imagine a future that has never happened before and then make that future come into reality. And so whatever it is that you think about the most, it will feed your imagination and you will start to, and you can have the ability to imagine different futures. And so what Paul is saying is when you elevate your thinking and you dwell on the things that God wants you to think about, you'll be able to see the future that God has for you and the things that he has called you to do. And so your mind might be riddled with thoughts that you know you don't want in there. There might be voices in your head that have come either from the enemy or from people or from the people you follow online or the books that you read that have started to shape and form your mind and you're becoming a person that you don't want to be. And Paul wants to free us from that. And so two things happen when we begin to align our thoughts with God's thoughts. One, our minds are renewed for God's purposes. And two, we are able to access a strength that will walk us through any circumstance. Number one, our minds are renewed for God's purposes in our lives. Did you know that God thinks about you? That God is in heaven right now thinking about you. He has thoughts about you. In fact, you were just a thought in God's imagination before you ever existed on this planet. Did you know that God has an imagination? He has dreams. You know, the biblical way of saying it is he has a will that he wants to see to come to fruition in your life. In fact, we see this in Jeremiah 29, 11, as God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to his people who are about to go into exile. They messed up. They rejected God. They did some terrible things. So God is allowing them to go into exile to experience his justice. But as they're walking out the door into exile, he says, oh, by the way, I have thoughts about you. And my thoughts are for you to have a hope and a future. And so what Paul is saying is if you think on these things, you will be able to align your thoughts with God and begin to see the future that God has in mind for you. He says it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so as we begin to think and to dwell on the things that God wants us to, we can start to align ourselves with the person of Jesus. We can become the person that God created us to be, and we can step into the future that God has in mind for us. And so Paul wants you to replace your negative thoughts, not just with positive thoughts, but with God's thoughts. And this is what he's laying out in chapter four. Pastor Noah talked about this a few weeks ago. He says, if you have any anxiousness in your mind, any fear or worry, I don't want that to be what dominates your mind because that's gonna work its way out into your life. And so Paul says, bring those thoughts, bring those concerns, bring your struggles before God with prayer and petition and thanksgiving. And it's this process that Paul is walking us through. He says, I want you to bring those thoughts to God and I want you to bring them with thanksgiving, meaning you're not just gonna wait and see if God grants you what your prayer request is and then thank him later. You're gonna bring your request to God with thanksgiving saying, God, hey, whatever it is that you do, I believe and trust is for my good. And when you do this, you can experience a piece of the scripture say even go beyond understanding. But Paul doesn't want you to just empty your mind of anxious thoughts or fears as maybe Eastern meditation would lead us to. But he then wants us to fill our minds with something else. And so he starts to just list things out. He says, I want you to think about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. And then he gives these two generalized terms. He said, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that word think means to meditate on, to permeate, to sit in. And so whatever dominates your thoughts are gonna be the thing that you see play out in your everyday life. It'll be the person that you become. And so the question you have to ask yourself is what is being inputted into my mind and into my heart? And Paul goes on in verse nine, he says, whatever you've learned or received from me, whatever you've heard from me, I want you to put it into practice. He just doesn't want you to sit there in your bed at night and think about nice things. He wants you to let those things shape and form you so that you can actually do something in your life so that you can see God's will for your life and step into the future that he has for you. There are dreams that God wants to put inside of your heart. 
There are things that he wants to entrust you with for the future, whether it's the family he wants you to start, the career he's calling you to step into, the book he wants you to write, the business he wants you to start. And he's like, if you're constantly inputting the wrong things into your mind, you won't be able to see the future that God has for you. And so he just lists these things. He says, I want you to input in your mind. I want you to think about and dwell upon whatever is true. Whatever is true. And this word true comes along with the idea of rejecting lies. I think oftentimes many of us struggle with the voices inside of our head. And they can come from the enemy. They can come from other people in our lives of these negative thoughts about who we are. And so what Paul is saying is, I want you to focus upon what God says about you. And so you might be trying to step into your future, but you're held back by the people in your past that said you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be able to do that thing that you have in your heart. You're never going to be that person. You might be held back by the mistakes you made and think, man, I want to step into the future that God has for me, but I'm afraid that if I do, that everyone will be like, oh, it's just that guy that did that thing in the past. And God's saying, no, I want you to think about what is true, which is this, that God loves you, that you are forgiven, that you are redeemed, that you are seen and that you are known and loved by God and that he has a purpose for your life, a good and pleasing, perfect purpose that he wants to instill inside of your soul. And as you focus on this, you'll be able to reject the negative in your mind and instead welcome what God says about you. Did you know in the scriptures in the book of Ephesians, it says that we are God's handiwork, that we are made in Christ Jesus to do good works. And that word handiwork comes from the Greek word poema, which means poem, which is where we get our word poem. Meaning you are God's beautiful art piece. Your life is being made as a beautiful art piece that people can look and say, look what God has done in their life. This is what is true about you. He says, I want you to think about what is honorable. And this word honorable in the Greek means whatever is praiseworthy or worthy of respect or something that invokes reverence or awe. And so you have to ask yourself this question. Is that to which you are giving your attention honorable and worthy of respect? Whether it's the movies that you watch, whether it's the books that you read, the podcasts you listen to. You ask yourself this question, is this something that is worthy of honor and respect? Does this make me think about other people in an honorable and respectful way? Or is this diluting my thinking? He says, I want you to think about whatever is right. And this word right in the Greek means whatever is good. And it's this idea of being straight and not crooked. You can ask yourself the question, does that, to which you are thinking about conform to what is righteous and good in the world? Or is it conforming to those things that are tainted and shady and off color? What, remember, whatever it is that you're inputting into your mind is gonna dominate your thoughts. And whatever that is that dominates your thoughts is gonna be the person that you become and the future that you have. So he goes on, he says, I want you to think about and dwell on and focus upon what is pure. And this idea of purity in your thoughts towards other people and their motives. So you can ask yourself this question, will it corrupt, will, will whatever it is that I'm thinking about or the way that I'm thinking about this person or what I'm inputting into my mind, will it corrupt our thinking toward other people if I give attention to it? And so if you look at pornography, you can ask yourself this question, is this making me honor women more or is it maybe making me just look at them as objects that I'm to consume? What is it that you're inputting in your mind and your heart? You will eventually become that thing. And so he goes on, he says, whatever is lovely. And this comes to the idea of loving action towards someone as if they were your friend. And so ask yourself, whatever it is I'm thinking about, I'm inputting, listening to, watching, reading, is this thing that's dominating my thoughts, producing rest and peace and love in my relationships with other people? Or is it creating more strife and turmoil? And then he says, Think about whatever is admirable. And this has to do with the way that we think about someone else's reputation. And so when you think about other people or when you think about yourself, are you concentrating on the good things we see in ourselves and others? Or are we just dwelling on people's faults, faults and failures? And, and there was this moment in my life where God started to elevate my thinking with the way I thought about other people. And he aligned, he started to work in me and align my heart to think in a true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable way about other people. There, there's a, 
a road that my wife and I drive down when we go to work and it's not through the best neighborhood in Cleveland and there's often homeless people there and usually it's not the same person every day. There's different people that are on the corners, hanging out, milling about, in and out of the stores and you can tell that they're homeless or experiencing homelessness. And there's one woman that was there every single day. Every other person was different. They always changed, came and went. But every day I drove to the work, on the same corner, every day I saw the same woman standing there. And you started to just like think about different things, you know, like you saw that interview that one time with that investigative journalist that followed around a homeless guy. And then at the end of the day, he like got in his Corvette and went home. And they're like, it's all fake, you know? And you're just like, I have so many questions about that. Like you're just on a Tuesday driving your Corvette and hanging out on a corner asking for like 20 bucks. And then like, I don't understand that. But in my mind, I started to paint this picture of what this person probably was. They probably just wanted money for drugs, maybe. I don't know. And so you just convince yourself things about the people that you've never met. And then eventually I just kept seeing this woman over and over and over on the corner. I'm like, man, I can't just drive by this woman without doing anything. So I began to pray and ask God. And in one sentence, God completely reframed my thinking about this woman to see this woman the way that he sees her. And I saw her and I said, God, what do you think about this woman? And I just heard this voice in my soul that I know was not for me because where my mind was going about people experiencing homelessness. And I heard God say this, there goes my daughter whom I love. And I saw this woman experiencing homelessness and all the things going on in her life. And I thought, oh my gosh, there goes a woman, there goes a daughter whom God loves. And I started to see what was true about her. I started to think of her in a lovely and admirable way because she's made in the image of God. I stopped thinking about her based on all the things that I've heard about homeless people, but I started to see her for who God says that she is. And so I just drove to the ATM and I'm like, I don't know how this works. I'm just gonna get some money out. And I drove back and grabbed some money and I brought it to her and I said, hey, what's your name? She said, my name is Monique. I said, hey, Monique, I wanna give you this money, but I don't wanna give you this money just so you can have it. I wanted to give it to you because I want you to know that God loves you. And then he sees you as his daughter. And then we prayed together and I gave her this hug. And then from that day forward, every day I would drive by, if she was there, I'd roll down my window. People would just drive by and be like, what's up, Monique? How you doing? She'd be like, I'm good. How are you? Bring food for her. If I had a little extra breakfast, I'd bring an extra banana. I'd give it to her in the morning. Nikki, my wife, she bought a jacket that we could give her for the winter. And my entire experience in my life was changed because God changed the way that I thought about other people. And Paul's writing, he's saying, I want you to think this way because God has a will and a purpose for you in your life. And that sometimes can feel like this big epic destiny, but he also just wants you to experience a different reality in your everyday life in the interactions that you have with people when you change the way that you think. And so number one, you can change the way that you think, align your thoughts with God's and see the world the way that God sees it. You can see the future that God has for you and it can actually bring about change and beauty in the establishing of God's kingdom here on earth based on what it is that you're thinking about the circumstances that you find yourself in. And that's why Paul says, hey, I want you to think about these things in verse eight. And then in verse nine, he says, and I want you to put it into practice. Because Jesus lived out all of these values and these attributes perfectly. And when we think about them, we're becoming more like Jesus. And when we become more like Jesus, we do more of the stuff that Jesus did. And when we do more of the stuff that Jesus did, we're establishing God's kingdom here on earth and being a part of the ultimate renewal of all things. And some of you are having a hard time stepping into the future that God has for you because you're stuck in your present circumstances unable to see what God is doing and what God is up to, or you're stuck in the past circumstances that have happened to you, which is why we come to number two, which is this. The more that you think on these things, the more that you think on your faith and think through the implications of your faith, the more that you can experience God's purposes and his goodness in every circumstance. And so Paul's writing, and he's writing from jail. And he's very aware that he's going to die, like not far in the future. And he writes at the end of chapter 4, which is at the end of his letter to the Philippians. And he first starts in verse 10 by saying he's so thankful that they renewed their concern for him because they didn't have any way of showing it. Essentially what happened was they sent this amazing care package to Paul in jail. And he's like, this is great. Look at this fruit basket. This is wonderful. I sent him all this stuff. That was supposed to be funny. (laughs) 
I don't know if they had a fruit basket service back then. That's what came into my mind. <laughs> That's the mode of dead jokes that Pastor Norris talks about. My jokes usually land really well, so. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> And so Paul goes on and he says, I'm not saying thank you because I was really in need, for I've learned what it means to be content in every circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every situation. He's saying, I have this secret that I want you to know about. And he goes on to say this, this famous line that we love to just kind of slap as a Band-Aid on some of our circumstances without actually understanding the deep implications of it. He says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That Paul's saying, I've been in amazing moments in my life and I've been in terrible moments and I've learned this secret that the more, he's saying it's in the context of chapter four, the more I think through my faith, the more I can gain strength. In fact, at the beginning of the book of Philippians, Paul says this in chapter one, verse 21, he says this, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What an epic line. He's actually writing to the Philippians at the beginning of this letter and he's talking to them about this reality that he's kind of torn. He's like, I don't know what would be better. Like if I die, I would be with Jesus. And that's actually like way better than anything I'm experiencing here. I would actually prefer to go and be with Jesus. He's like, but if I remain here in this body, I know that I will have great purpose. Even while he's in the midst of jail, he understands that he has great purpose, even in his struggles and his circumstances, because he gets to serve the church, step into his personal calling, the will that God has for him. And he's able to gain this strength from who? From Jesus. Because he's thought through the implications of his faith when it comes to all of the dire circumstances that he finds himself in. See, in an atheistic or secular worldview, they would say, hey, uh, don't think about death. Don't think about the cosmic reality of the world that we live in because eventually, no matter what you do, uh, the sun's gonna burn out and we're all gone. And that's the end. When you die, you just go back into the ground. So don't think about it. Just try and enjoy your life in the here and now. Just try and be present. Don't think about those future realities that are coming. See, but in, in what Paul is saying is he's saying, I want you to think about the truth of your faith more and more and more. And so while in other worldviews, they would say, don't think about the future realities. The Christian faith would say, no, think about it more. Don't just dwell on death, but dwell on the reality of what happened to death when Jesus walked out of the grave. And Paul has this secret. And it's a secret that this guy Horatio Spafford knew as well. Horatio Spafford lived in the 1800s and he lost his entire business in a fire in Chicago. So he's trying to rebuild his life. And so what he decided to do was send his wife and four daughters in a boat over to England to have some time there. He was gonna kind of rebuild some things here in America and then he was gonna travel over to be with them. And on the trip over, the boat tragically sank and they lost their four daughters as the boat went down. And his wife miraculously survived. They found her unconscious on a piece of wreckage, pulled her, she made it to England, survived, recovered, and sent a, a telegram to her husband that said, saved alone. And Horatio Spafford became, began to make his way from America over to England on a boat. And when the boat passed over the same spot where that where his family's boat went down. The captain pulled him up and said, hey, this is the spot where your family's boat went down. And he went down to his cabin and he prayed. And he wrote the famous hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And I want to read you just a small portion of this hymn that he wrote. And he says this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How could that be? How could you stand in the worst possible moment and say, it is well with my soul? I could imagine that maybe Jesus' closest friends and followers were probably feeling this exact same way or struggling with this as they watched Jesus crucified. 
Because for Jesus' followers to watch him crucified on a cross, they had to have thought to themselves, this is the worst possible outcome for us. Our friend is being murdered. And not only is our friend being murdered, but he's being murdered unjustly. And not only is our friend being murdered, but we were convinced that he was the guy. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to set everything right. And they were staring in the face of their worst possible outcome. But what they didn't understand was that they were actually staring at the most beautiful moment in human history. That if they would just look a little bit longer, they would see that actually God was bringing something beautiful and life-giving even out of the darkest moment that they were standing in. And this is the secret that Paul has. He's like, oh, I've thought about it. And what I've realized is that the implication of my faith is that death is not the end. And if Jesus really walked out of the grave and he's really setting everything right and he's really going to come back in the end, as Revelation says, at the end of the scripture, he's going to wipe away every tear. Here's what I can hold firm to in every circumstance I find myself in, that no matter what I walk through in my life, if Jesus really rose from the dead, everything's going to be okay. That God is at work. And the scriptures say this, that God works together everything for the good of those who love them. And a modern example of this is Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert is a person of faith, and there was an interview that he did with Anderson Cooper. And the crazy thing about both of their lives is that they both lost their dads when they were 10 years old. And in the last couple of years, there was an interview that Anderson Cooper did with Colbert, and they were talking about these tragedies in their life. And Anderson Cooper brings up a quote that Stephen Colbert said in a previous interview. And Anderson Cooper looks at Stephen Colbert and he says, you were quoted as saying this, I have learned to love the thing that I most wish had not happened. And then in that interview, Colbert quotes J.R.R. Tolkien famously in Lord of the Rings when he says, what punishments of God are not gifts? And then Anderson Cooper is overwhelmed with emotion. And you can just think to yourself, man, he's just thinking about losing his dad. And he's like, he looks at Colbert and says, do you really believe that? And you could just see this joy come over Colbert's face. And you're like, what? Why are you smiling? And he says, yeah, I really believe that. He's like, it's, and he goes on to say this. He says, it's a gift to exist. And with existence comes suffering. But he says, the beauty of the sacrifice of Christ is this, is that God suffered too. That not only are you not alone, because God did it too, but God is actually at work making something beautiful out of all the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so Paul's closing out this letter with death knocking at his door, and he's like, I want you to think about that. I want you to think through your faith and recognize that no matter what it is that you're walking through in your life, that God is there with you, that God suffered too. Not only is he with you, but he overcame death and the power of evil. And in your relationship to him, he's actually gonna write a beautiful story in your life. And so some of you, you need to go through a process of allowing God to elevate your thoughts to see what he's doing in your present circumstance. That there is a dream he wants to put in your heart. There's a future of freedom that he wants you to have from your negative thoughts, from the thoughts of your present circumstance, of the fear of what might happen, of the thoughts of your past, of the things that are controlling you, of the things that people have said about you. He wants to free you from those thoughts. And he's laid out for us how to do it. And it comes through the renewing of our mind through the power of God's relationship with us. And so as we close, I'll just ask you this question as we close. What is it that has dominated your mind the most? God might want to free you from that thing so that you can see the future that he has for you. Let me pray for you. God, I'm just so thankful that in all the moments that I've walked through in my life, that I could look back and say, oh, God was there with me. I wasn't alone. And so we just pray, I just pray, Lord, for each person in this room. No matter what it is that they're experiencing, no matter what it is they're walking through, they might be staring in the face of what they would say is their greatest tragedy, and they don't understand. They need you to show up. They need to experience the depth of knowledge of what it means that you're actually renewing all things, that you're at work in their story, that they're not alone, that you're walking alongside of them, that you're gonna do something beautiful through even the circumstance that they're walking through. And so we just pray that as we close today, that you would begin to speak into people's lives, Lord, that you would be able to pinpoint those things, maybe the things they've never even verbalized that they've been carrying with them that has dominated their mind and it stopped them from stepping into the future that you have for them. We just pray that there would be freedom in this room today, Lord.
And some of you, you're like, man, I need Jesus in my life. I need that relationship with God. I want the power that comes in a life with Jesus. I wanna have my thoughts freed and renewed. And maybe you're here and you wanna cross that line of faith and you wanna give your life to Jesus. I'm just gonna invite you while your heads are bowed, eyes are closed and you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to run down to the altar or anything. Just, you can just say this prayer out loud. If you're here and you wanna commit your life to Jesus, or maybe you wanna recommit your life to Jesus. You wanna invite him into your life. You can just say this prayer out loud. The scriptures say that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is the Lord, that you'll be saved, that you'll come into a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this is a prayer that's gonna go straight from your lips to God's ears. And it's just gonna be the beginning of an ongoing loving relationship with, between you and God. So if you're here and you wanna make that commitment today, you can just say these words. Jesus, give, I give you my life. I'm all in, no turning back. I believe that you came to die for me. And in you, I can have the life my soul is searching for. Thank you for your sacrifice for me. In Jesus' name, amen.